Well, here we are, starting a new journey right before vacation. Maybe that's when journeys are supposed to start, when you leave for vacation. Miss Joetta, how are you today? How's your baby? Well medicated. How about your bigger baby boy right there? Wearing baby blue today. Yeah. They need you on that field, brother. Yeah. Seventeen what? Yeah. Your brain's seventeen, but your body ain't long gone past seventeen, eh? Boy, I'll tell you what, I love every one of y'all, even those of you that I don't know. Thank you for being here today. Piper, I love you too. Yeah. I know, it's so sweet. Our journey today is going to take us on a path through Scripture. I've been reading this book by Ty Gibson, The Sonship of Christ. If you don't have it, uh, we're not supplying it for you, I'm encouraging you to get it. If you do have it, I'm encouraging you to read it again. The Sonship of Christ, for those of you at home, we get no uh, kickback for this. But The Sonship of Christ, Ty Gibson, printed by uh, uh, um, Pacific Press. So you can get it at the ABC. You can get it off of Amazon, which will then deliver it straight to your home. But... um, This is the springboard from which we are jumping into Scripture to start our newest journey. Now, the purpose for today is that we are going to present an apparent, I must put this apparent in quotes here, we are going to experience an apparent contradiction in Scripture. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy the third chapter chapter. Well, where's 2 Timothy? Right before Hebrews, in the T section, to the right of George Eats Popcorn, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those of you that just realized you were hungry, hang tight. We'll be done in just a few minutes. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Now, Miss Joetta, I'm presenting what is an apparent contradiction in Scripture. So I cannot stick to the New Testament and the Old Testament references because I have some Old Testament references on the New Testament side. So if you will forgive, I'll just push it over, but then I'd have to preach behind the piano for the other one. 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, it says, Paul writing to Timothy, and that from a child you have known the what? The Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 16, all Scripture is given by, what is this word? Inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for evidence, for correction and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. How much of Scripture was inspired by God? So when we look at this apparent contradiction in our broader view of Scripture, we must understand that something that is apparent on the surface may not be the reality when you get into the depths of what God is trying to say. So we are going to have a a set of Scriptures over here that present one idea. And we're going to have a set of Scriptures over here that present a completely opposite idea, but because we know that all Scripture is inspired by the Spirit of God, and Scripture does not contradict itself in essential Scripture truths, then you and I know that it is definitely just an apparent contradiction, and under the surface of this, the truth lies. But we've got to present the contradiction. And so over here, we're, when I was uh, in, at Southern Adventist University, I didn't graduate from there, you understand, but I was there. I took a speech class. And in that speech class, I had to prove that JFK was taken out by one man. 
And then, because this is a topic that I chose, you know, that JFK movie just came out two and a half hours long in the theater, longest movie you ever went to. And then, in that exact same speech class, right immediately following the one idea, I had to present the opposite idea, and then the class got to choose which one they thought I believed. I want you to know that I'm going to do that today. And it is going to look completely contradictory. This idea is going to look as if it con contradicts this idea. Now, the amazing part about going on vacation for two Sabbaths is that you get to wonder what, pray tell, is the outcome of this for two weeks. Because we will not come to a settled agreement today. And you get to guess which one I believe or not. Actually, because it will all come from Scripture, it must be true. How do we understand this contradiction? Get on with it, Pastor. What is the contradiction? Go with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. Throughout Scripture, God uses the idea of Jesus being the Son of God to relay to us the concept that God promised a covenant to His people through... First of all, who was the first son that God promised a covenant... that God promised the Redeemer to come through? Oh, you look at y'all. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. What about Adam and Eve? You know, when Eve had her firstborn son, she said, I have gotten a man the Lord. She thought that Cain, her firstborn son, was going to be the Messiah. Here we are now. We are in what reference? John chapter 3 and verse 16. And it reads, John 3, notice Miss Joetta, I'm on this side of this apparent contradiction. It says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His, what's the next two words? Only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So here is a foundational text for this side of the argument. The argument is that Jesus was begotten. Now, every one of you know how you got here. And so... There's this thought that since Jesus... And you didn't get here in a car, by the way. That's where we'll leave it. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the only begotten Son of the Father. Now, Melanie and I have six kids... They all arrived in our family through various different means and processes, but they are all ours. So I do not have an only begotten. But the Father has an only begotten Son. Steve, do you have any sons? I've met one of your sons. You have a son. He came here with his beautiful bride, right? He wasn't so bad looking himself. Oh, his beautiful girlfriend. Maybe it'll be his bride one day. Um, who had more authority when he was five years old? Him or you? Oh, her. <laughs> okay, dokie. Well, anyway, we're going to leave that alone. The idea is that when something is begotten, it proceeds out of and it originates from something else. Does that make sense? Go with me to Colossians chapter 1. Again, we are presenting two sides of an argument here. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16. Colossians 1 verse 15. Scripture says here in Colossians 1 and verse 15, it reads, Speaking of Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God. What, is it? what are the next two words? The firstborn of every creature. And so now we have this idea that Jesus was begotten and that Jesus was born. Now this, 
this could rock our Christian experience. Because all of our lives, we have stood somewhere between here and here, and we quote John 3.16 all the time, and yet at other times we join the other half of the argument, and we read Micah 5.2 that says that Jesus always existed. And so how do we, well, we have to build the case before we reconcile it, and reconciliation comes on December 17. That's when we begin, Brother Dave, because that's the next time I'm preaching. Because we're taking vacation. So if you have an emergency, pass it through the head elder. Who will determine whether your cat's broken third toe is an emergency or not. You know I'm always there. My, you know my phone number. If you need us, we're here. But that's not what vacation is for, so be kind. It says in verse 15 that Jesus is the firstborn of every creature. So for this side of this argument, Jesus is begotten. Jesus is the firstborn, meaning that He was, or implying that He was born. Go with me now to 1 Corinthians. Go to John 14 first. Let's go to John 14, verse 28. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John 14, verse 28. John 14, so for those of you that are visiting, that think Pastor Scott's a heretic so far this morning, please tune in online on uh, December 17. You can watch the archived uh, video after you get home from your church service. John 14, 28 says this, Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says something very interesting. John 14, 28, Jesus said, you have heard how I said unto you. I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice. Because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is what? Greater than I am. So, we got this idea of Jesus being begotten, Jesus being born, and now we have this idea that Jesus postulates for us, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I am. That sounds to me like there's this hierarchical status. Does that sound what it sounds like to you? Like, I'm here and the Father is here. Does that sound like what Jesus is saying? Paul buttresses that statement in 1 Corinthians 15. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Paul even buttresses what Jesus says. 1 Corinthians 15, we will be, I believe, in 27. 1 Corinthians 15, yeah, verse 27. It's going to sound like Greek, even though it's translated into English. Uh, And if William were taking Greek, he could read it for us in Greek. But at this point, he's taking Hebrew. By the way, church, he's acing Hebrew. Acing it. He would never brag on himself, but make sure you give him an attaboy when you go out today. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 15, still on this side of this apparent contradiction. For he hath put all things under his feet. So you have these two he's, and one he puts all things under the his feet. But when he said all things are put under him, it is evident that the one that put things under him is accepted from being under him. Okay, let's unpack it. He, number one, says to He, number two, I am putting all things under you. So, who is it in this scenario that is the greater of the two he's? Okay, you have this he that puts all things under this he. So, this he has authority to tell this he that all things are going under him now. And so then this he, according to Paul, let's keep reading. It says here in verse 28. 
end with verse 28. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So here Paul says for us the same thing that Jesus said. Jesus said, the Father is greater than me. And Paul says that God put all things under him, meaning Jesus. And so here is one side of this apparent contradiction. Let's go to the other side. Now remember, this is just an on-the-surface contradiction. I'm not trying to get you to walk out of here and say, ah, the Bible can't be trusted or believed. What I want you to do is think about this for the next two weeks. I want you to eat, live, and breathe how Jesus can be the Son of God and begotten and yet be what this side of the argument says. Because remember, who inspired all of these individuals to write? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So go with me now to the old, the New Testament book of Philippians. Let's go to Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse... Philippians, I'm sitting here reading chapter 2, chapter 2, and it's just not getting there. And I'm like, well, I'm in the wrong book. All right, Philippians chapter 2. Miss Joetta, I'm in the right side of Scripture and on the right side of the argument at this point, especially from your point of view. The Bible says in Philippians 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God. Here, wait, wait, wait. Paul told us that Jesus was the firstborn. Paul told us that Jesus, all things were put under Jesus by the Father. And now the very same author is telling me that Jesus was equal with the Father? Does that sound like a contradictory thing to you? Well, what does it say? What does it say then, if that's not what it says? To something to be what? Your scripture will probably continue, your version, did not think equality with God to be something that would to be exploited, which means that he had what with God the Father? Equality. We'll buttress to this argument with another reference. How about that? You'll clarify that next? you clarify. Are you preaching next week? Glory be to God. That'll be a good sermon, y'all. Turn with me to our scripture reading, John chapter 1, verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John chapter 1 and verse 1. Is that really the reference you're pre preaching on next Sabbath? Oh, not yet. It is now. Got to get my two cents in worth for the 17th. Who's preaching the following Sabbath? Bobby Jean, you preaching on that topic? I'm on, all three of us preaching on the 17th. I'm going to tell you that right now. All right, here we are, John chapter 1, verse 1. It says this. I kind of ant bite on my thigh for y'all, so those of y'all that are wondering. Um, John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the what? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same, verse 2, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who's the Him referring to? Okay, stick with the words that are used in the Word. Thank you. Thank you. All things were made by Him, referring to the Word. And without Him the Word was not anything made that was made. So how much... Did the Word that was with God and the Word that was God, how much did this Word make? All things. You can probably quote verse 14. Now, wait a minute. Verse 14 is going to say something completely contradictory to what John said Jesus said in John 14, 28. 
This is the same author making a contradictory statement. He says in verse 14, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Who is the one that was made flesh and dwelt among us? And we beheld His glory. Go back to your references. Read it. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the what? What? The only begotten of the Father is the one that made all things. So how did the Word make the Word? It's a good question. If the Word made all things, how did the Word make the Word? And if the Word made all things, as Scripture says that the Word did, that Word becomes flesh, that Word is Jesus, the only begotten, the only, be, the only begotten, Wait a minute, if Jesus is begotten, then how can Jesus create himself? It's just an apparent contradiction here. This should baffle us. Unless we've read this book or others like it, I suppose. I highly recommend that you get this book. It will enhance, it will springboard you into Scripture to the point where you're like, aha, aha. Jesus made everything, therefore Jesus is in the category of the unmade, which would contradict our idea of firstborn. But maybe it contradicts our idea of firstborn because you and I are not Jewish, and all the firstborn got us was the responsibility of taking care of our younger siblings when mom and dad went to work. I was not the older sibling, by the way. And I did not enjoy being cared for by my older sibling. As nice as he is. Watch this one. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9. And verse 6. Isaiah 9 and verse 6 says this. Isaiah 9 verse 6. 4. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Who is this referring? To whom is this referring? I almost had a dangling preposition on that sentence. This is referring to Jesus. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called, read with me, Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. What? What? The everlasting what? Wait a minute. I thought this verse was talking about the Son. And what does it say to call the Son? What do we do with this? Because if He's the everlasting Father, as John will tell us in a moment, and as the book of Exodus, Jesus talking, or God talking to uh, Moses will tell us, since He is the everlasting Father, or one of His names is everlasting Father, how could He be begotten of Himself? Elias, do you see any contradictions here? Superficial. Yeah. Elias is like, Pastor, you let me preach on the 17th. We'll straighten this out in three and a half minutes. Turn with me to Exodus 3 and verse 14. Genesis, Exodus 3 and verse 14. Exodus 3 and verse 14. Exodus 3 and verse 14, and uh, this is where God is speaking to Moses out of the what? The burning bush that did not burn was not consumed. It says, And God said unto Moses, I'm over here on this side of the argument, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And He said, This is what you should say to the children of Israel. I am has sent me unto you. And so the Jews, 
Jesus is going to use this very same language to tell the Jews who he is. And the Jews do not misunderstand what Jesus says. Go with me to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 9. We'll not cut it here. John chapter 8. And let's start in verse 56. John 8 verse 56. Remember the I am the God of the Old Testament. Verse 56, Jesus is speaking to the Jews, and Jesus says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, Man, you're not even 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what does he say? I am. This infuriated the Jews that Jesus was talking to. Because the Jews had no, no issue understanding exactly what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I am that God of the Old Testament that delivered Israel from the bondage of Egypt. And so, how do they react? The very next verse. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So Jesus, who over here said, the Father is greater than I, over here Jesus says, I am the God Almighty, the God that delivered Israel from Egypt. And so we have two ideologies here. One ideology says that Jesus is begotten, that Jesus had a beginning, that Jesus was the firstborn over here. And was that scriptural? We had Bible verses to back it up. And then we have this ideology that Jesus is coexisting with the Father, that Jesus made all things, and how can the Maker make Himself unless He pre-existed Himself to make Himself? That's whoo! Then we have this ideology that Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And so what do we do with these apparent contradictions? What does it truly mean to be begotten? What does it mean to be the firstborn? Does that firstborn language carry any nuances out of the Old Testament? Is Jesus the firstborn in the flesh, coming the first child to be begotten of God the Father? Is that the sense that Jesus is the begotten? Uh, did, did Jesus really coexist as the Word that was with God, that made all things? Did He really coexist with the Father throughout the e ceaseless ages of eternity past? This, these are the questions that we will begin answering on December 17, providing that Steve and Bob don't mess it up. <laughs> That's where we are. This is important stuff to understand because if we misunderstand Jesus being the firstborn and the only begotten, then we will open up doors that lead us down a road of the Holy Spirit not even being part of the triune God. And so, if we haven't confused you enough this morning, maybe we have sparked some interest. What are things that you're going to want to study? Proverbs chapter 8. Study Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 talks about wisdom. Look at the concepts of Proverbs chapter 8. And uh, in Proverbs chapter 8, wisdom is personified. What person has those characteristics that are applied to wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8? Another scripture chapter that you may want to study is Psalm 2, the second psalm. Uh, in Psalm 2, this day have I begotten you occurs. 
And so you will want to study that out. Uh, you can also study out the son of. Put the son of in your uh, search engine on your Bible program, whatever program you use. You can put it into the duck, duck, go uh, of your choice as far as a search engine. And um, they won't even know that you have gone to uh, look up Bible verses, whoever they is. But uh, look up, quote, the son of, end quote, and Bible. And ask yourself, when you're reading through all those, he begat, he begat, he begat, the son of, the son of, the son of, ask yourself, what is the importance of being the son of someone? And on December 17, we will begin unweaving an apparent contradiction, and we will again believe, or continue to believe, that Scripture is one unflawed whole when it comes to the voice of God sharing with us His truth. It's going to be a fun journey, and we're going to be on this journey together. Uh, I'm so glad you had a great Thanksgiving, and so very glad that uh, you're going to enjoy listening to Mr. Steve and Mr. Bob as they break the word of life for you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for giving us a challenge today, for allowing us to begin to think about concepts that have baffled Christian theologians and non-Christian history people, historians for thousands of years. We ask that as we are on this journey with you, that you will lead us and guide us, and that the truth will set us free. We love you, Father. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.